Welcome back to the Mixology Talk podcast. This is episode number 159. And if you've been listening to the last couple of episodes, you know that we've had some big changes that were coming. So today is the launch of our first kind of series or new focus on podcasts. We're going to be focusing on a subject matter for about a month and then going on to the next subject. So today we're going to learn all about Julia's favorite spirit, and that is rum. Stay tuned. Welcome back, everyone, to the Mixology Talk podcast. Super excited to talk to Matt. I'm going to butcher your last name, so why don't you go ahead and just say your last name for uh, me? Matt, Matt, Matt Petrick. I've, I've had it butchered all over the place, so Matt Petrick. Is now Matt Petrick. So thank you so much for joining us. Rum expert, author of a brand new book, Minimalist Tiki. And I think so we're still waiting for the test to come back, but I'm pretty sure you're as close as I've ever seen to a modern-day pirate. Um, so <laughs> definitely welcome to the podcast, man. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Great. Um, so, I mean, I don't, I got to confess to you, I don't know as much as I should about rum. I've kind of, uh, I mentioned this earlier to you, but I have this kind of blinder when it comes to rum. It's been kind of a running theme in this podcast. My wife loves it. Um, but I haven't been so devoted to my knowledge base. So, um, I'm excited to talk to you about everything there is about rum um, and kind of just pick your brain about the subject. Um, Let's do it. Perfect. So uh, what, what got you excited and kind of focusing on rum as a category? Like what, what got you so interested in, in, in the spirit? Yeah. So I would say like, like many people uh, and many other sort of rum experts or authors, uh, it was Tiki that sort of drew me in. Uh, we were, my wife and I were rebuilding a house in 2007, and uh, we we noticed our space for a little Tiki bar, or a little bar that we could make into a sort of a, like where I could make Tiki drinks. And uh, at some point, we were like not living in a house, and my wife uh, bought me a copy of the Beach from Berry book, a sip and safari, and I read through it, and I'm like, okay, what is this guy in a room? What's this Jamaica room? <clears throat> what's this rum anchor coal and why do I not see these things at the grocery store? And, and, you know, and I, this is Washington was still a control state at the time. So I'd go to the state liquor store and they'll be like, I can't find these things. Like, it's like, it was like, you know, no offense to Bacardi, but you know, the, the basic stuff like Bacardi, there were none of these exotic rums were out there. And so luckily we traveled a lot. And so when I would, uh, when I would, we'd travel out of state or you know, internationally, we'd bring home, um, it's like, oh, okay, here's the Demerara rum. Now at least we figure out what this tastes like. Uh, and and so you know, I, I can get quite obsessive at times. If, something, if I like something, I'll dig in very deep. Mm -hmm. And uh, sort of like I started collecting, you know, like, you know, at some point I'm like, oh, it's, you know, oh, I have 15 bottles of rum. And you know, it's like, I have 50 bottles of rum. And you know, <laughs> now I have over 100 bottles of rum. And, it, and it's gone up from there. But it's sort of, uh, it's, it's become you know, fascinating just because rum, un unlike, you know, a spirit like bourbon or a single malt scotch whiskey or a cognac where there's just like they're made in one place and, you know, one set of producers and, you know, they're sort of standardized as well. Rum is from all over the place. So um, it, you're continuously finding new things, like new rums you haven't had, new styles, new flavors. Uh, it's just so uh, diverse in how it's made in different places that you know you're, you're you'll never stop learning about it i you know i've been geeking out for a while and i'm still learning uh interesting things about it so it's just there's just so so much to you know for a geek like me there's just so much to really you know dive into yeah and um to your point you know when we travel um you know if we went to thailand for a honeymoon quite a few years ago and you know it seems like almost every country in the world makes rum um, mm -hmm. or at least quite a few of them do anyways. Um, so yeah. what, let's kind of start at the basics here. What exactly is, is rum? I know okay. it's kind of a stupid no, question, I, but <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a great question. Um, I'll, um, I'll let me back up and go just a tiny bit broader here. Okay. <clears throat> you know what I like when, you know, cause I love all spirits and I like to educate about spirits in general. They say there's really only a few fundamental types of spirits and they're all made from you know a sort of a particular type of source material so for example if you're using a a grain you're making a whiskey 
Mm-hmm. And there are subcategories of whiskey, you know, like a bourbon or a single malt scotch <clears throat> or rye or what have you. Uh, if you're using um, a fruit, and it's a grape, usually grape, but you can do other fruits, it's, it's a brandy. Mm-hmm. So, for example, you know, grapes, you know, make cognac, they make pisco, uh, apples, and make, you know, apple jack or calvados. Uh, so we have grapes, we have fruits. <clears throat> now, if you're using something from, like, you know, an agave base, you know, you have the tequila, mezcal, so it's all that family. And then when it comes to rum, or when it comes to cane, if you're making spare from cane, uh, from sugar cane specifically, not from, not from sugar, but from sugar cane. So it's, you know, you can't make rum from beet sugar, for example, but if it comes from sugar cane, be it juice or molasses or something that, that comes from um, the processing of sugar cane, then uh, it's a rum, you know, and there, there are people, you know, who will say like, well, you know, there's cachaca and there's different words for it, but collectively, you know, many people in the world refer to that thing. If it comes from a cane spirit, it's called rum. And you can learn the rum or in Spanish, it'd be rum, in French, it'd be rum, R-H-U-M, um, you know, and again, like you, you can really geek out at their names, but you know, for the general consumer who's just getting into it, rum means made from cane, from a sugar cane. Got it. And as far as like the taste profiles go, you'll have a little bit more, I imagine, uh, molasses notes um, and a little probably heavier mm-hmm. on the palate than, let's say, a vodka or a gin, which will be a little bit more botanically focused. Yeah. Is that yeah, yeah. kind I mean, of a broad stroke category? Um, yeah, I mean, in, I mean, in general, I, I would say with with any distilled spirit, you want to taste something of the source material. Mm-hmm. That that you know, a whiskey, you should get some notes of the grain, and a, and a and a you know, a, you know, certainly like a Calvados, you should get a, an apple flavor to it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there should there should be a you know, ideally would be a molasses flavor or some aspect of molasses flavor in a molasses based rum. Um, now, mind you, there are styles of rum that are made directly from cane juice. Um, so, you know, they, they just go straight from cane, fresh cane juice to a rum, uh, and they'll have more sort of what they call grassy vegetable notes. Um, and, you know, they'll, you know, you can, if you fit into a cane stock, you would probably recognize that in, that, in that, those styles of rum. Got it. Okay, perfect. And now, um, one of the things that's really interesting interested me in the category of rum, um, just in my limited research in the past, is the history. Right. Rum is absolutely just dripping with really cool stories and uh, great history uh, as far as a spirit category goes. Um, so just kind of like a rough estimate, how long has rum kind of been around? Um, <clears throat> oh, good Lord. Yeah, I mean, there, <laughs> there's a lot of yeah, that's a great, great question. There's a, a lot of different ways you can answer. Um, you know, if you're trying to look at the history of things from, from cane spirits, or I'm sorry, from cane, sugar cane, you know, you can go back to, you know, to Indonesia, uh, places like that. Uh, David, uh, David Wondrich has written about uh, Batavia Rock, which is sort of like a, uh, an Eastern, or a, a, what the appropriate regional term is, but essentially Indonesia and Java, places like that. A spirit called Batavia Rock, which is sort of like a rum, but sort of not. Um, <clears throat> uh, if you go back into as far as like uh, around 1500, I forget the exact date, but um, basically distillation techniques had come to Brazil by the mid 1500s, and so they were making, uh, you know, what today we would identify as cachaça. Uh, <clears throat> if you if you define rum as as a Caribbean spirit. Uh, rum uh, is believed to come to the Caribbean in sometime around 1630s, 1640s. Uh, we're we're still sort of uncovering some of that history. Is is exactly you know the earliest date, but you know there's there's a strong consensus that some of the the people who are making uh, cane spirits in Brazil came over to Barbados in like 1630s, 1640s. Um, some all, some stories say that they you know that they went to a French island, but in that general sixteen sort of like as as the uh, Caribbean was really sort of ramping up and becoming sort of like the farmland for Europe, that's when you start seeing a rise in in what we you know modern day rum uh, production. Got it. Okay, perfect. Um, and uh, it sounds like, or it seems like, a lot of the stories that you hear are kind of revolved around that particular time where. You know, you have the open seas, you have all these boats, you know, just packed with rum and pirates and all that stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. 
Do you have a favorite story? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I mean, the, the the pirate thing, I think it's overblown a lot. Sure. Um, uh, some, somebody's actually written that, you know, it's more like the pirates are probably drinking, you know, like a, a French brandy, I believe it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, likewise, you know, like another story is like just the story of Nelson's blood and how, you know, Admiral Nelson, British Admiral Nelson was, you know, died in battle and had to be transported back to to uh, England, and so they stored his body, first they preserved his body in a cask of rum, and then sailors got thirsty, you know, and emptied a cask and drank the rum, and, you know, and, and that's where the blood came from, except that, again, you know, historical evidence suggests it was probably more like a, a you know, a French brandy. Um, <clears throat> I mean, that whole era, basically, from the, the 1600s through uh, around the 1950s or so, basically 300 years, you would call it um, the age of sort of colonial rule in the Caribbean, that mm-hmm. essentially great, the great powers like you know, you know England, France, Spain, um, to a lesser extent, um, oh, I think Denmark, I think it's Denmark, don't quote me on that, but essentially mm-hmm. they, they essentially there, the colonies were, you know, the, the Caribbean was essentially their farmlands where they could 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 uh, grow sugar cane, grow tobacco, things that they could not make in Europe. And so um, they were they were very strongly um, using those colonies as to you know, grow things. And, you know, vast amounts of that rum was actually, you know, basically made, um, shipped and cast unaged back to the mother country um, for further processing, maybe like they would take the agent there. Um, it was very much of a commodity thing at the time. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then one of the things that I uh, came across, and I'm hoping you can kind of discuss a little bit, um, is the impact that Phloxra had on the rum market, because I know that um, in craft cocktails, in um, a lot of it was based on brandy, like you were mentioning. And then Phloxra had hit, kind of wiped out a lot of the brandy and wine industry in Europe. So that had kind of a big right. global impact on, on spirit production. Um, did it have uh, the, a similar impact on, on rum and the Caribbeans and, and rum production? Yeah, I mean, uh, Philoxera is just, is just one example of sort of like geopolitics and geohistory influencing mm-hmm. categories. Um, if you step back and you look, you know, look at um, European history, if you, look at, um, if you look at the bigger span of time, you'll see all sorts of things. So. Uh, that influenced rum um, generally for the negative and that, you know, they made it harder for the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, although sometimes they, they increased it like the Lox era. It's like now, okay, now we're, we can't make, we don't have the grapes to make, to make um, brandy. So we're sub, we'll substitute it for rum. Um, but an example of something like the other way mm-hmm. was what they call, um, sort of the, I call the rise of the sugar beet in that, um, generally, the story is that uh, France was having a hard time consistently getting uh, their cane sugar from the um, from the Caribbean because they were constantly at war with England, and basically, like their islands were being blockaded. It was just essentially they they couldn't rely on on uh, the agricultural products coming in from their colonies in the Caribbean, which today would be Martinique and Guadeloupe, uh, and so they you know basically said we're going to start trying to you know grow sugar locally and in the form of sugar beets. So basically they developed the technology to process sugar out of sugar beets. And when that happened, that sort of um, drove the price of, of sugar down, you know, sort of globally in you know, mm-hmm. time. We're talking 1700s, 1800s. Uh, I mean, actually it started in about 1815, 1820, uh, sort of drove that price down. Uh, and so that impacted rum very negatively because, you know, rum, rum was sort of secondary to sugar. The, that the, the growing of sugar cane was primarily to make sugar, you know, to send back to Europe. And mm-hmm. if, and if it wasn't profitable to grow sugar, then they, then farmers weren't going to grow sugar. And if they weren't, they didn't have sugar, they didn't have molasses left over uh, to make rum. And that, that actual, um, Later led to the rise of what we call rum agricole, uh, like from Martinique, for example, where they said essentially farmers said, well, we, we have these crops and we can't, you know, nobody's going to pay us to make sugar, or, you know, molasses from them. Like, let's just make rum directly from, directly from uh, uh, the sugar cane juice directly, you know, forget trying to make sugar and molasses from it. Mm-hmm. 
Interesting. So it was a, kind of that price um, pricing that kind of influenced a broader production of rum, it sounds like. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, you know, sort of one, one of the things I've, uh, one of my big projects lately, uh, beyond the Tiki book, uh, which we, we'll talk about in a bit, um, is actually written, also done um, some in very in depth research uh, for a book on basically the history of British rum uh, from about 1650 through, through the Black Tot in 1970, and gone through countless historical documents trying to piece together like what happened to the rum once it made it back to England. So basically what were London dock rums and what were, what was British Navy rum, what, what was it truly? And, um, you know, when you, when you're looking at it in the scope of 300 years of history, uh, you see all sorts of things, um, you know, sort of cause, cause economic impact, uh, you know, like competition from British distillers making whiskey, for example, uh, and, you know, the rise of the columns, so all sorts of things basically, cause economic influences, which cause vast swings in the amount of, of rum being made uh, on the different islands. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's really hard to generalize in a sentence or two or, or even, you know, a book or two. It's just there's so much, so many layers there. No, absolutely. And like I said, it's one of the reasons, um, you know, I know I haven't done as extensive research, but when I have researched rum, I'm like, oh, my God, this is this is a rabbit hole. You could go as deep as no, you want to go. <laughs> Absolutely, and you know, and you, you start going down into things like, like uh, high ester Jamaican rum. Like, where did that come about? You know, that was again sort of the European thing of, of essentially like Germany and Austria were like, hey, we we want to, we don't want to support you know foreign sources of rum. We want we want to foreign spirits. So we're gonna we're gonna make spirits locally, um, but they had a taste for um, Jamaican rum, and so they essentially. Uh, somebody figured out how to make essentially rum concentrate, um, which was basically what today we call high ester rum, rum concentrate, and ship that in smaller quantities to Germany and Austria, and then they would blend it with their own locally made spirits to make a Jamaican rum that was really just you know a tiny fraction made in Jamaica and more from their local spirits, but um, you know it saved them substantially on taxes. Basically, they didn't have to pay import duty and tariffs. On, on the full volume of Jamaican rum. And so, you know, that, that sort of economic incentive created, again, created the, the, a whole style of rum, say we call high ester um, Jamaican rum. Excellent. So uh, this is actually a really good point um, to kind of shift a little bit and kind of backtrack. Um, we've mentioned a, a few different categories of rum um, during our conversation, but I'm hoping maybe you can give us the main categories and kind of how to organize <laughs> the different styles. Um, right. Rum categories. That's uh, there's actually something and you know, I'll take the opportunity to, to plug, you know, my book here, which yep. is minimalist you there. There, there's a very in-depth uh, rum section in there. It's about 45 pages where I, I sort of go through the rum categories and essentially say that like with many things in life, we don't use one categorization system for everything. We, we choose a category that fits the need at hand. Right. So I'll give you an example. Cars, it's like, well, you could categorize cars, categorize the cars by what color they are, uh, who made them, uh, what their style is, like it's an SUV, it's a, it's a roadster, it's a, you know, it's a truck, uh, you, know, we, you know, by what year it is. Like we, different categorization systems to meet the need at hand. So in rum, you know, the, the, the unfortunate categorization that, you know, most people who are new to it or have no experience with it is they use color, which is, you know, white, gold, dark, black. And, and color is just an awful categorization system because it, it implies no way about, nothing about the flavor profile. So, for example, you know, a distillery could make an unaged, basically almost flavorless white rum. Um, a flavorless rum, you know, variable flavor, and then it would, but it would look the same in the bottle as, say, an overproof Jamaican rum, which is extremely flavorful. Um, or it, it would taste very different from a rum like uh, uh, Plantation Three Stars or Banks Five, uh, which are which are a blend of rums and and are often um, like filtered um, to create you know a clear color, but they have to have age elements to them. So color, color is, is, you know, I try to say like color is not a great way. Mm -hmm. um, there is a categorization system that some people, that somebody, you know, you know, was sort of rose in popularity and then 
some people are backtracking from it. Um, I, I call it the colonial categories. Uh, so essentially things like we call like a Spanish style rum, a French style rum, an English style rum. And um, if, if you, they can be very helpful descriptors if you really understand rum. Like mm-hmm. if, if you know enough to sort of grasp what, what they truly mean and where they come from, they can be a handy shortcut. Um, but they can also be confusing. Like if you're just coming into the category and you can say like, well, what <clears throat> is, you know, this rum being made here sounds like a French style rum, but it's not a French island. So there, there, are, there are some downsides to that, um, to that, that categorization. But in general, you know, I would say, like for example, Spanish style rum generally would mean um, it's lighter, it's calm, distilled, it's from molasses. Um, it's the styles that are traditionally made in uh, today would be like Cuba and Puerto Rico, you know, Panama. Uh, other, another style, the French style, uh, is essentially what some people would call rum agricole. Uh, which is, is essentially it's directly from king juice, uh, and it is column stilled. Uh, and then the English style, which is, uh, you know, the English were the last to sort of give up their, their pot stills. Like while the, the you know, while the, well, the Spanish and the, and the French sort of like moved column stills pretty early, the English and particularly Jamaicans held on to their pot stills for a longer time. And you know, pot stills give you a, a heavier, um, sort of, some would say, meatier rum, a little more hefty. Um, and so the <clears throat> English style uh, is traditionally like entirely pot still or a blend of pot and column rums, and again, molasses based. Um, but again, so these, these are categories that, like, if you understand them well enough to wrap your head around them, then you probably understand these subtleties. But, you know, people would point out, for example, today on, on Martinique, there is a distillery that's making a cane juice rum, but they're using you know, a batch still. And so it's like, well, that's, you know, you know, that doesn't fit the French definition. And like, yeah, that's an exception. Uh, again, you have to understand, you know, sort of the subtleties. Um, so that, you know, so that's a categorization system. Another one uh, that's become popular, uh, it's discussed at least amongst the sort of the rum, rum Illuminati, I guess you should call them, is the, called the, the Gargano categorization, which is kind of roughly equivalent, you could say it's, it's com- comparable to like the different categories of Scott whiskey. <clears throat> so, for example, a pure single rum uh, must be made in a in a batch still uh, from one estate, et cetera, et cetera. Sort of sort, sort of like an equivalent to single malt Scotch whiskey. Uh, and then there's um, pure, I think it's pure blended rum. I forget the exact names. They change every once in a while. But like pure <laughs> blended rum is could be a rum of um, uh, rum of pot and column stills from a again from a single state. Uh, there's it's a, a solid book that, that's a different what they call different Gargano categories, and essentially it's like you know there's some amount of value attribution to them, like a pure single rum being made in the pot still on one estate. You know, it's sort of more expensive to make than than something made in a column still, you know, and blended together from multiple different distilleries, possibly different countries. So, so that that Gargano category is is, is um, one approach, and and this guy's mowing her lawn right now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, it's all right. I, it I, happens. I, yeah, he was done earlier, and I then suddenly he decided to start up again. Um, <laughs> so anyhow. Um, yeah, so Gargano categories, and then like a more uh, another one, more recent one is uh, called like the Kate categorization, which is in Martin Kate's book, the Smuggler's Cove uh, TE book, which also sort of he has his own categories of like twenty three different categories. They're sort of an evolution of the Kate categorization that bring into account things like um, aging and things like that. So. There's, there's, you know, it's like there's all sorts of different ways to categorize rum. Um, I actually, myself, I tend to sort of not try to do that too much. I, you know, I, I can wrap my head around this is a column still rum, this is a pot still rum. Um, was it, you know, what distillery was it made at? You know, sort of like if you know, categories are great uh, up to a certain extent, but but you know, if you really get into rum, you can kind of move beyond categories into sort of understanding all the different parameters and like each run is unique in its own way. So yeah, absolutely. it's pretty long winded. No, absolutely. And I think it, it just goes to kind of reinforce the fact that it's so fluid. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, right. you know, it, as long as you can kind of get the base knowledge and get the understanding to kind of wrap your head mm-hmm. around a spirit category, I feel right. like that's the first step. 
And then it starts to right. create interest yeah. and, you know, uh, intellectual yeah. curiosity about the spirit in general. And then you're off to the races. Um, exactly. I, and then, I like to think of it as like selectively revealing, like, is like every, like, you know, you have to start out with the big picture stuff and then, and you build up that knowledge and understanding. And then you're, you're constantly coming up against something like, oh, this doesn't fit into my, my worldview yet. And like, oh, and so you have to construct a more elaborate worldview. And he said, uh, that's the rabbit hole. Sure. Is your worldview continues to get more and more and more complex. Um, and, you know, and of course, as you do that, you're like, well, I need an example of that. And then at some point you end up with like, like, 400 rums on your shelf like I have. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's so, it's so like spirits in general just fascinate me because of the history and, you know, all the stories that are evolved around them. Um, I find them just right. absolutely fascinating. And then you try and you're like, holy cow, this is super interesting. Like I had a pot, yeah, overproof yeah. pot still Jamaican rum for the first time, like mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago. I was like, this is mind blowing. This is so good. Yeah. And uh, exactly. no. yeah. yeah, and then wait, which is something like the the Haitian Clarence, for example, like those are like like as intense or more intense than the overproof Jamaican, but in a completely different direction. Sure. Uh, or you know, like some of the stuff from the Reunion Island. I mean, it's, it, there's so many crazy flavors that are very different from than you know, with, you know, a Bacardi Dole, for example. And it's just a matter of how do we, you know, as a rum educator, how do we get people to to be willing to try it and sort of and, and just jump in and, and see what they like. Absolutely. You know, we're still finding, you know, still finding that perception that this is like that, you know, all rum should be $12, you know, for a, for a gallon. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. That's for sure. Um, but this actually yeah. brings up a really good point. Um, now, if, if a complete newbie goes to this door, First of all, probably stay away from like your Safeways and Bonds and Albertsons and all that stuff. If you're buying high end spirits or you want a good introduction of spirits, um, let's say they go to a bottle shop and they have a really great selection of rum. Um, how do they navigate this? How, what would be your recommendation um, for like buying rum for the first time? Right. I guess, you know, the, the, the question would I, the first question I, I would ask is well, what is, what is your purpose for this? Are you intending to, to mix it in a cocktail? Are you intending to mix it in tiki cocktails? Are you intending to mix it or to, to drink it straight? Like, what are you, what are you after here? Mm -hmm. And the, the, the answer is really going to is depend on that. Um, so, so, so answer that, answer that question for me. What, give, give me a specific and I'll tell you. Yeah, absolutely. So let's say we want to have a really good rum for making cocktails, classic cocktails like the daiquiri, for example, or a grog or something along those lines, like right. what would be a really good, just um, easily adaptable mm -hmm. rum for, for cocktails. Right. It still has good flavor. Right. Right. So I would, so traditionally, for example, the daiquiri, your basic rum sours are traditionally made with lighter, not, not unflavorable, but like a lighter rum, which we, we would call a Spanish heritage style rum or in the old days, like Cuban style rum. Uh, something from like a, one of the one of the not bottom of the line, you know, Bacardi. So like something maybe nicer than like you know the Bacardi um, Bacardi Silver. But mm -hmm. um, they have they have had some decent rooms, you know, even in the white categories at like twenty two or twenty five dollar price point. Uh, Don Q is another is another example of that. Um, you know, Don Q um, Anejo, for example, you know, a little bit of age to it. Um, uh, Panama um, has uh, like Canya Brava, Canya Brava, three year, lovely rum. Unfortunately, just been um, <laughs> just been discontinued. Oh no! Um, but you, yeah, you're yeah, you're looking in something in that in that sort of style. Um, if you want like a good all all around rum that that you can use in a in, you know you still use it in daiquiri, but then it still have a little heft for like so like a stronger, more flavor forward drinks like tiki drinks. Something like um, like a Mountain Day Eclipse, or and like a Dorley's Five Year, or uh, you know Plantation Five Grand Reserve uh, from Barbados, or like Worthy Park of Gold, for example. There's just there's plenty of them all over the map. Uh, it's sort of you know it's a, unfortunately it's not a category where where it's like say bourbon and say well 
you know, pick something from Buffalo Trace or pick something from Wild Turkey is uh, you're, you're where you're going to use it um, really sort of, or what you buy really is going to depend on what you want from it. Sure. That said, I do, you know, there are fantastic rums across um, all different styles for, you can buy for you know, $40, $45 or less. Um, I've done a couple pieces on a cocktail wonk. And uh, for Bevy, one one is was where, where I talk about how basically you know an introduction to the main sort of styles of rum that you start with for like thirty dollars or less, and then more recently I did one for my own site where it's essentially the best best representative rum of every island, or basically every rum producing country in the Caribbean for forty five dollars or less. So if you want a rum from St. Lucia, here's what you should buy to start out with. If you want a rum from Jamaica, here's what you start out with. If you want one from Martinique, here's what you should start out with. So it's just it's just so much a broader category than again single malt scotch whiskey or bourbon or cognac uh, that it's really hard to sort of you know give you like start with these bottles. So. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so would you mind if I um, get those those uh, links from you uh, for your website and we'll yeah. include them in the show notes? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Perfect. Yeah, that'd be great because I know I'd like to kind of expand my um, my room selection for sure, um, and I'm sure I'm just going to use that as a, a potential shopping list. <laughs> good, good, good. Love it. Um, perfect. Now, let's say uh, last last question is, as far as this ta- category goes. Um, what would be the good all around just sipper? Like, I'm just going to pour myself rum in a glass, maybe over ice, and just sit here and, and really enjoy the flavor. Right. I'd say, you know, if you're looking for something in like the $40, $50 range, uh, that, you know, it's a, it's a good sipper. You can enjoy it. You know, and yeah, sure. You can go drop $200 on a bottle. From, you can drop a thousand if you want, but, um, uh, something like, you know, I tend to gravitate towards the British style, the English style, um, uh, but like Appleton 12, uh, which is now, I think it's Appleton rare cast. I think it is, uh, Appleton 12 Mount Gay XO is good. Uh, the Don Q, uh, like the 2005, 2007, 2009, those are great. I love those. Uh, that's, a, that's a more Spanish style rum. Mm-hmm. Um, there's great, uh, in the French style, there's great, like, uh, things from Clement, like rum Clement, like a, a single barrel. It's probably only like 30 or $35. Um, you know, I could, I could just go on and on. And on. <laughs> Actually, you can, you know, plug, plug the book a tiny bit, but I do yep. have a section there about, about essentially, um, I call them the, like the, the minimalist tiki category. Like these are the styles of rum um, flavor profiles that are used traditionally in tiki recipes the most. So, for example, a Jamaican style rum, an overproof Jamaican rum, a demerara rum, an overproof demerara rum, uh, a lightly aged and filtered rum, a, a moderately aged rum. For each of those different sort of styles, I have a a list of these. These are ones that are sort of like well within that style or not super expensive. And that you'd have no, you know, would would you know be expensive to use in a tiki drink, for example. Got it. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, we'll definitely include a link to the book and those uh, links for the buying guides for the uh, the rum and different right. islands and the thirty dollar or less in the uh, show notes for sure. Now, um, so if people wanted to kind of follow you on social media or reach out to you um, regarding rum in general, uh, what would be the best platform? Your favorite platform for that? So, um, I, I try to do, I try to do everything within reason. Like I'm not, I'm not on, on Snapchat, for example, but, uh, <laughs> uh, my, my, my primary website where, where I sort of do my wonky writing is uh, cocktailwonk.com. Um, it's where I sort of, Hey, it's just, this is just, it's just, it's just my love of the stuff and I'm going to write something and I don't care if nobody's going to pay me to write it. This is what I'm going to put up there. The cocktailwonk.com. Uh, and then uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, it's all cocktail wonk. Um, I tend to, my, my um, Facebook feed is, I'm sorry, my, on Facebook, cocktail wonk, the cocktail wonk page is sort of a, similar to my blog, and it's kind of, you know, sort of, sort of rum focused, but in like anything's game on it, but it's sort of being kind of more sort of um, informational, like newsy type of stuff. Uh, my cocktail launch Instagram is more uh, cocktail focused, in particular tiki cocktail focused. I mean, I love cocktails. I love making cocktails. <clears throat> I can I can make craft cocktails and classic cocktails. So the cows come home. 
uh, the Kiki is my sort of true passion. Uh, so cocktail walk on Instagram is more about um, cocktails. Uh, also on Instagram, I have one called Rum Wonk, separate Instagram feed called Rum Wonk, and that Rum Wonk, and that's where I put things which are like interesting bottles, like, you know, I acquired this unique bottle or that interesting story about that bottle or, or rum focused, um, or very rum focused. You know, I, I figured out like Instagram sort of like you have to do one thing and do it well. And so, you know, if you got a cocktail crowd following you and you put like, a bottle, bottle shot, you know, short, you, you get no response. So I sort of split that, that segment up. Like, here's the cocktail geek stuff. Here's the, here's the rum geek stuff. Nice. Um, and then Twitter, I'm not as, as active on Twitter, but cocktail on Twitter. So generally, like, if you search for cocktail walk, you'll find me. Perfect. Excellent. Well, we'll definitely include those social media handles in the show notes as well. Oh, and then also, I've also got an Instagram, like, I have a dedicated feed for the minimalist tiki. So, tiki <laughs> and things like that. Perfect. And then, is that handle at minimalist tiki? Yeah, at minimalist tiki. Perfect. I try, I try to be very clear about these things. It definitely helps. The confusion yeah. uh, is not something you want on social media. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Like, how, like, how is this person that brand? I don't, I don't understand it. Yeah. Right. No, absolutely. For sure. So um, thank you so much for your education and then, um, you know, talking about rum with us. Um, I, I learned a ton uh, just from our conversation and hopefully everybody did as well. Um, but we'll include all those links in the show notes. And Matt, I, like I said, thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. You're welcome. You're very welcome. It was my pleasure. I'm, I'm always happy to talk around. Once again, thank you, Matt, for joining us on the podcast. As soon as I got done with this podcast, I literally bought his book. I have been hearing nothing but great things about this book all over Facebook for weeks. So I was super excited that he was able to join us and I'm equally excited for reading the book. Now, I'm sure you've heard over the beginning and over the last couple of podcasts, I was talking about this revamp. Uh, we've launched both of our new groups, or one new group anyways, for enthusiasts, people that are wanting to learn more about cocktails and how to make great cocktails, check it out over at abarabub.com groups. Now, all the industry professionals, we have a great group for you as well, the craft bartender community, and you can check it out at the same link, abarabub.com groups. Cheers, everyone, and we'll talk to you soon.